So good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's event. We're live from the Britain Room in Trinity College, Oxford. Uh, my name is James McDougall. I'm a fellow in history here and also the director of Oxford Theatre Guild's production of Andromache, some stills from which you can see uh, behind us. Uh, very pleased to be here tonight. Uh, this is part of the Oxford University's Humanities Cultural Programme, one of the founding stones of the new Stephen Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities, which will be opening in physical location in Oxford in a few years' time. Uh, the pictures that you're seeing uh, behind me in the room and uh, hopefully on the live stream as well are just some stills from our show, which has been selling out this week uh, and which we're delighted to have been able to stage in Trinity College's 17th century chapel, a really evocative uh, atmospheric space for this classic 17th century Greek tragedy uh, in a new translation, or rather a newly revised translation, I should say, by David Breyer, who's uh, sitting next to me. Uh, the show's been a tremendously exciting thing for me to work on as someone who started out as a student of uh, French uh, and also as a historian, uh, a play I fell in love with back in the 90s when I was an undergraduate, uh, and which uh, it's been really great fun to work on. I'm joined to discuss it and to discuss the practicalities and the challenges of uh, translating and staging the text by uh, my colleague uh, at the far left, Catherine Ibbett. Catherine is Professor of French and Fellow in French here at Trinity. Uh, she is an uh, expert on 16th and 17th century French culture and literature. Fiona McIntosh, who is a Fellow of St Hilda's College and Professor of Classical Reception. Uh, she's an expert in uh, classical theatre and the director of the Archive of Performances of Greek and Roman Drama here at the University of Oxford. And finally, by David Breyer, the translator of our version of the play. David started his career in theatre as a stage manager at the Royal Court back in the 60s. Uh, he then uh, taught in Vienna, uh, moved back to theatre in the UK at the National, uh, worked uh, on the Laurence Olivier stage and many of the classic uh, shows there in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, in 1984, he was commissioned by Cheek by Jowl Theatre Company to produce uh, a new English verse translation of Racine's Andromaque for them. And it was their uh, premiere of that show that helped establish that company as uh, the internationally acclaimed Olivier Award winning uh, newcomers that they immediately became. Uh, that version was never revived until uh, David revised it uh, for us uh, uh, last year, in fact. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to welcome David to Oxford uh, and to see his show. So Catherine's going to speak first, followed by Fiona, then David. There'll be a little conversation and hopefully we'll have time for questions uh, from the audience in the room and from you at home at the end. So, Catherine. Thanks, James. Um, thanks, James. And thank you uh, for putting together this wonderful production. I saw the dress rehearsal. Uh, earlier this week and I'm really pleased to see members of the cast in the audience and perhaps uh, we can get talking with them in the Q&A too. I'm not going to give a lecture on Racine, um, uh, especially because I'm out of practice <laughs> in person lectures, but I want to draw attention to a few things that I noticed in the production that I think are really interesting in Racine's work and that this translation and this production uh, bring out. And the first is in fact the sense of place. So Racine um, as every uh, student of French literature learns, Racine is operating with a loosely derived understanding of what are called uh, the unities, um, loosely derived from Aristotle, sometimes recodified. Um, and uh, one of the things that Racine is very conscious of in putting together um, his theatrical world is what we call the unity of place, that everything that takes place in the play is meant to take place in the same place. And in fact, um, the stage directions are often quite specific. We have lists of uh, what the set decorators were putting together for Racine's productions. Um, and here it's a very specific room uh, in the palace of Pyrrhus, but everything takes place there. So we have a very tightly controlled stage. And then we have this ex that's often very claustrophobic. In fact, I talk talked a lot with my students during lockdown about Racine being the, the perfect playwright for us. But there is this glorious, um, sometimes menacing, but sometimes kind of dizzying sense of the world beyond as well. And that comes across, I think, really beautifully in this production. Um, partly because of your choices, James, the sound effects. I don't know what kind of spoilers I'm allowed <laughs> to make here, but the sound effects will make clear to you, I think, that we're clinging to the edge of the Mediterranean. Racine's often operating in these spaces where we have a sense of the sea beyond. Um, 
And uh, in your translation, David, this wonderful moment I was telling you earlier, it brought tears to my eyes, um, where Pilad, I'm sorry, I'm going to call you by your French names, um, is constantly saying to Ores, Let, let's get out of here, let's go to the harbour where our friends will come soon. I was really uh, struck by this. this. This is the kind of the dream of Racine, I think, the sea and our, and our allies. And um, it's, of course, very important here to play about diplomacy, about international relations, but also about getting your friend out of there, um, getting that to a harbour, not, not a harbour that's a safe, a safe haven, but a harbour from which you can leave, this kind of dream of, of crossing the seas uh, to find another place. The other place that's very clearly marked here and um, extraordinarily compellingly marked in this production is um, the altar and temple, which in Racine's text is, of course, off stage. It's, it's talked about constantly. It's where very various terrible things will happen. Um, but here, of course, we're in Trinity Chapel. Um, and so we are in front of the altar. I found uh, the, the, the moment towards the end where Oreste is in front of the altar uh, will change the way I think about the play. Um, re really extraordinarily moving. And for me, in part move, moving because in Racine's later work, uh, where he's working more with religious drama, um, he's very interested in this question of the altar and temple, for example, in his final play, Atali, which I hope uh, James might turn to later. I was also moved by it for a particular Trinity reason, which is that that chapel in this Oxford college is also a 17th century French production. The ceiling was painted by the Huguenot refugee Pierre Berger. Um, and it, I, I found that really wonderful to think about these kinds of multiple sea crossings um, and violent uh, histories uh, that brought us here. The other thing that is um, striking to a specialist in French about this production is that um, a certain somebody appears on stage, Astyanax, um, the, the child uh, of uh, Andromache. I'm going to try not to say Andromache. Um, so this child has an extraordinary significance in the play. This is a play that turns around kind of getting stuck on the past and also somehow getting stuck on the future. There's a very difficult futurity here. Um, and Astyanax in Racine is not on stage, but is this extraordinary, powerful presence, in some way as powerful a presence as Hector, his father. Um, and so uh, various purists amongst my colleagues were truly horrified <laughs> when the poster was tweeted with, uh, with Astyanax out there. I'm, I, I'm not for purity, um, <laughs> and I found... Uh, the presence of Astyanax, again, I don't want to make a spoiler alert, but at the beginning and at the end of your production, um, very powerful indeed. Um, I was also struck by the way that David's translation brings out something about the relation between Andromache and Astyanax. There's a scene early on where uh, Pyrrhus is kind of blocking Andromache and she says, you know, get past me, I want to get to my child. And in your version, it's, I haven't yet held him in my arms today. And it makes it a sort of maternal visit. In the French, it's, je n'ai pas encore pleuré avec lui, which makes him a kind of co-mourner rather than the object of maternal care. And uh, it's really, I, it was interesting to me how well that translation works with the bringing of Astyanax uh, onto stage. But yeah, immensely significant uh, non-speaking role. Um, the other immensely significant roles here that were brought out beautifully, I, I thought, in the production were the roles of what in sort of Racine parlance are called the confident, the friend roles. So here, Cephise, uh, Phoenix, and I'm forgetting the third one. Cleon. Uh, Cleon, Cleon, that's right, thank you. Um, so Phoenix is uh, played by this gentleman here. One of, that's one of my all time favorite Racine roles and your performance of it was just a delight. Um, so, the, the major roles in this play are all a little bit off the scale. They're doing big emotions. And one of the things that the confidant does is say, could, could you just dial it down a little <laughs> bit? We've got to get off stage here or, you know, that this scene is coming to an end. And there's a, um, a, a, a beautiful moment in French where Phoenix says to Oreste, modérez votre fureur. And in your translation, it's hide your fury. I was really struck by this, the, the kind of moderation versus dissimulation uh, of your madness. But that y y you have a slightly irritated performance <laughs> of, of, of this role that is it's just impeccable. I, I enjoyed it enormously and it will, it will stay 
safe for me. So I, I urge the audience to pay attention to the minor roles. I think uh, they're playing an extraordinarily important kind of um, ambassadorial function here. And this is a play about embassies, attempted embassies speaking via envoys. And I think the confidant is one, dramaturgically, um, is one such, uh, th that's one of their functions. So emotion, um, I work on the history of emotions. I won't, I won't go into a kind of reading of the particular emotional language here. But one thing I will say, so the, the emotional world of arrest Oreste and Pyrrhus was enormously discussed uh, in the first reception of this play. Um, Racine's many critics, um, as well as many fans, were very eager to say that a character was too much this or not enough that. So Oreste's sadness, for example, uh, was much discussed. Um, and Pyrrhus uh, was famously either for some too galant, too kind of loverly, too much into kind of uh, a courtly behavior and for others, too ferocious. And there's a wonderful line um, in Racine's preface where he says, well, he's too ferocious, you know, what can I do about it? He hadn't yet read our novels, our mm. novels in which, you know, they're, they're kind of sighing, um, courtly lovers. Um, and I found your Pyrrhus, James, or Pyrrhus here, uh, um, I thought that he might have read a whole set of different novels mm. somehow. That there's a, that this is a, a, a kind of a, a not non-ferocious, but equally, but still terrifying Pyrrhus. And so I'd be interested to hear you, mm. James or Pyrrhus, on um, what novels Pyrrhus might have read between the 17th and the 21st century to, to produce him uh, in this uh, way. And I think that's all I want to say. I'll, I've got various moments. I'd, be happy to come back in on. But I do want to uh, finish by acknowledging how important it is for me as a um, languages person that this is a production made possible by the study of modern languages. And please urge your uh, acquaintances to go on with that study. Um, this is a play translated by somebody who got to know um, a world of literature not available in English and who's enriched uh, the British theatre scene in that translation by James, who was a student of modern languages and has been stuck on this play ever since. And it, it, it's really important, I think, for the health of our theatrical scene uh, that we continue to sustain that kind of study. Thanks. Fiona. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, James. Um, I haven't yet seen uh, the production, unlike Catherine, so I'm going to speak from a, a, a kind of point of anticipation and also very much um, as a classicist, um, a classicist who've learned, I have to say, a huge amount from modern linguists and was one of those few classicists who might have ended up doing modern languages. So um, <laughs> I, I concur absolutely with Catherine. And as a classicist, I think one question um, I might start with was, um, or is, um, have we got here um, an example of a copy that actually is better than the original. And definitely some of my colleagues today would feel that. Uh, and there is some sense, uh, from what we know from uh, scholarship in antiquity, that this play was anomalous. It didn't, for example, get performed uh, in Euripides' version in Athens, which was pretty unusual. And um, post 17th century, no one really speaks about Euripides' play. And I'm struck that um, uh, James says, I fell in love with this play when I was an undergraduate. I don't think there is any um, classicist <laughs> who would say, I fell in love with Euripides' Andromache, mm. above all because I don't think they would have read it. Mm. And I, th I find that very curious, and I've also found it very instructive today to consider a play that has really dropped out of the repertoire altogether, Euripides' play, in conjunction with Racine. And, and, and also, I'm very struck that that's not a very, um, a very sort of contemporary way of thinking about the reception of antiquity. Putting Racine next to Euripides is now from some of my colleagues, considered to be rather an old-fashioned thing to do. Mm. And what I've learned is 
I think seriously we ought to do it, and I know there are definitely undergraduates in this university who, who are mm. asked to do it, mm. but I think there should be classes who should be asked to do mm. this as well. And now those who don't have French can use David's translation, so even better. So why did antiquity perhaps, but also especially um, scholars in the modern world find this Euripidean version, the Euripides Andromache, anomalous? Well, above all, because it is very different from Racine's version, um, it, is, uh, it has a very disjunctive plot. It starts off looking like a suppliant play. Um, Andromache is taken refuge at um, mm. the, the altar um, of, of, uh, of, of Thetis, um, the sea nymph Thetis. And it then moves into something that looks like a Euripidean escape play. And it ends up looking like a revenge play. And above all, the protagonist, Andromache, disappears halfway through the play. And um, for any scholar um, after Shakespeare, they are extremely uncomfortable with any tragedy that looks like it has competing um, uh, actors uh, who look like the protagonist and then quite clearly are not. So in some ways, the reasons for this being a non-canonical Greek tragedy were, and as um, the modern linguists around the table will well know, is because, of course, classical scholars were themselves very much um, shaping their own reading of Greek tragedy according to neoclassical mm. readings of tragedy. So, uh, of course, therefore, as a classicist, we absolutely <laughs> need to engage with Racine. And, and as many of you know, um, Racine was a very serious Euripidean scholar. And so what he did to transform Euripides is, I think, very instructive. The major uh, difference um, is uh, apparent to um, perhaps those of you who, who know the Euripides, um, but perhaps don't know the Racine. And it was apparent from what Catherine uh, said a moment ago, and that is the centrality of a Styanax because in Euripides' version, Astyanax does not survive the fall of Troy. He is shockingly thrown from the battlements. Here in Racine, we're told that uh, um, this was um, a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, means of subterfuge, enabled Astyanax actually to survive, but in Euripides, he doesn't. But the major difference in Euripides is that Andromache has a child but she has a child because she's been forced to have a child, to bear the child of Pyrrhus, Neoptolemus in, in the Greek. Uh, she's forced because she's now enslaved. She's an enslaved woman who has no choice. And so she has a child with the man who uh, killed her father and the man who is uh, the son of the killer of Hector, her husband. So right at the beginning, um, we see, I think, a very, very different, much, much more vulnerable Andromache. So I began by saying that we have we got um, a, a copy that exceeds the original. I think to some extent you're beginning to understand that thinking in terms of original and copy is actually not very helpful. And the Andromache that I think we find in Racine is much more like the Andromache in many ways that we find in Homer in book six of the Iliad. This is, I'm interested too, that David's translation has maybe um, brought out almost more of the devoted mother and the absolutely loyal wife that is very Homeric. That seems to me almost to be very knowingly and deliberately for Racine, a major source. The other source, and the source that allows us Styanax to survive, is actually post-classical, and um, uh, you, people around the table may know more, but as I understand it, it seems to be uh, essentially from medieval traditions. Mm -hmm. And as Catherine implied, this is because a Styanax implies a future. 
And so keeping him alive and therefore Troy alive is, is absolutely key. So we have different characters in the Euripides. Um, of course, we have no confidant because they replace the chorus. That makes it feel very different. Catherine's talked about the interiority, the kind of pressure cooker, as people often say, of, of, of Racine, the lockdown Racine. Um, Greek tragedy is completely different. It's always public. I mean, neoclassical theorists hated it for that reason, um, because how could you possibly, um, you know, uh, plot, make a plot, hatch a plot with a chorus in the room who were likely to spill the beans? <laughs> so um, uh, on grounds of verisimilitude, you couldn't have a chorus. But of course, I think most people completely understand that that's because the Greek chorus is always political. It's always likely to interrogate a ruler and as the Jesuits in the following century especially in the early 18th century in France realize if you want to have a revolution you need a chorus so at the time of Racine quite clearly it is not compatible with the monarchical society so there is no chorus um, and that changes the play very much um, it also, I think, as Catherine says, there is very much a sense of a sense of an outside world, another world beyond this pressure cooker, this interior uh, in in Racine. But the outside world is absolutely to the forefront in Euripides' play. Ethnic tensions are everywhere. This is, in some ways, and and. Some people say this is why um, it was not popular uh, in, in, in Athens or it wasn't played in Athens. And that is because it's a very anti-Spartan play. Mm. Um, Hermione comes from Sparta. And this means in northern Greece, as we are in Thessaly, um, uh, that this is in many ways a play the time the, the Athenians are at war with, with the Spartans, the very long Peloponnesian War. And so the politics is absolutely under the surface um, and occasionally even coming to the surface um, in this play. So it is very, very different. And James asked us to think also about why, why is Racine... And I'm going to add, why is Euripides perhaps worthy of serious consideration today? In many ways, um, James talks, uh, I imagine James wrote the programme notes, brilliant programme notes to the production about um, toxic masculinity. And I think um, that comes across absolutely wonderfully in, in David's translation. And um, I'm looking forward to the production to see that. But also, it is both for Racine and above all for Euripides, it's a play that reminds us absolutely that perhaps the main victims of war are women. Euripides doesn't just write Andromache to show that. He also writes the Trojan women. And around about the time of Andromache, if probably a, a little earlier, he wrote the Hecuba. And so for Euripides, this is really a play um, about the suffering of women, the needless suffering of women at war. And um, you know, there is at this time, people um, often date it around this time, but there is a really, really ugly incident at Plataea in 427 BCE um, during the Peloponnesian War when the Spartans massacre well over 200 um, men and they enslave all the women and then raise the city to the ground. Exactly, of course, what happened at Troy and in legendary Troy and now it happens in actuality. And I think if we're staging this play in 2021, of course, we can't forget that we've got the example of the Yazidi women in Iraq, we've got the ISIS brides, and most immediately we've got all those women um, who we hear about tragically daily in Afghanistan and beyond. So I 
thank you so much for asking me to read both these plays and to recognise that definitely I must urge my students to look at Euripides, Andromache, and definitely read um, David's translation or the Racine, if they have the French, um, uh, in conjunction with it. Thanks, Sarah. David. Okay, yes. I'm full of admiration that you can uh, speak so freely. I, when I heard about the 10 minute <laughs> limit, I was terrified that uh, being a bit of a windbag, I would go over, well over <laughs> 10 minutes. So I wrote a lot of this down. I'll try and read it so that it's not uh, obviously a bit dry. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to say, first of all, that Andromache was, in fact, the very first translation of a play that I ever did, way back in 1984, uh, a good year for some. Uh, for Cheek by Jowl it was, as, as has already been mentioned. And so I can call her my firstborn. I'll come back to that. <laughs> so now, about six years ago, uh, shortly after I moved house, I was contacted by a lady academic, who said, sadly whose name I can't remember. I, my computer crashed and I couldn't find the original email. But uh, she was uh, after a look at the translation, and I was, uh, so I turned, you know, hunted around to try and find it, and uh, turned out cold cupboards. Uh, but to my absolute chagrin, I could not find it for the life of me. Imagine, you know, your firstborn <laughs> sort of <laughs> mislaid your eldest daughter <laughs> somehow, rather careless. And uh, I had to go back to her and say, I think I probably lost it in the move. Terrible. So I lived with this sort of cloud over me for some time. And um, uh, then uh, about two years ago it was, I think, two and a half years ago roughly, I was up in our loft hunting around and having a look through some boxes that had remained unpacked uh, after the move. And lo and behold, I looked in a box and there it was. <laughs> this is the original <laughs> copy. <laughs> which I thought I'd show you. Uh, so as you can imagine my thrill at finding it. Now, um, combined with the um, uh, thrill at being uh, able to uh, y y look at it again um, and be reunited, um, <laughs> this was around about the time of the first lockdown. And there she was. Uh, and being filled uh, with redoubled fatherly affection, I set about the long considered task of revising it. Five pages into this, who, what should happen? I get a res an email from another academic, this time James McDougall, <laughs> who also is after this very same translation. So I was now able, duly able, to send him a copy of plus the five pages that I'd begun to revise. He liked the revisions and encouraged me to continue, which is what I did. So. My main thrust here is to talk about this 1984 version uh, that I wanted to improve on. Why? And this is the main focus. So to answer this, I'd like to go back to the very first time I was approached by Cheek by Jowl uh, and invited to, f to um, submit um, a draft of two particular sections. One of them was the very first scene, uh, first two pages of the scene. And uh, Declan Donnellan, who's the, you've already heard, the director of, um, uh, of the Cheek Bao Jowl, um, expressed the wish for the play to be in rhyming couplets because he liked the idea of such often barbaric emotions being held within the straitjacket of a heroic couplet. The tension uh, brought about by such co um, contradiction being not only dramatic in its own right, but also reflecting what Racine is all about. This was him, yeah? Um, so this was my first attempt. Uh, at the beginning, at the very beginning of the scene, the first line spoken by Orestes. Okay, here we go. Now that I have found you once more, most loyal friend, cruel fortune's anger with me will surely end. Indeed, her mood already shows a deal more fair since that she took such pains to reunite us here. Whoever would have thought Pylades were the one Orestes would first see on shores his oath should shun. <laughs> that he, having lost you over six months ago, to find you again, to Pyrrhus court should go. That line there 
Orestes would first see on shore as his oath was shunned. It was a bit of a nightmare <laughs> for an actor, I think. <laughs> Glad I never, uh, they never took it on. So you can hear rhyming couplets throughout in lines of 12 syllables, six stresses, the nearest I could get to an Alexandrine. However, it may not surprise you to learn that Declan wasn't terribly impressed <laughs> by this. And after a few more attempts, he uh, said to imagine that the play was going to be performed in modern dress, which it was, of course. And uh, this suggestion was the spur um, to what finally uh, he found he could work with. So here now is the same speech, but in modern dress. And it's taken from the, the 1984 uh, translation. So... You can listen to the different cha the changes that have been made. Yes, finding such a loyal friend as you once more convinces me my luck has taken a turn for the better. Indeed, things already seem to have improved in that fate's seen fit to reunite us. Whoever would have said that in a land I'd sworn to avoid, Pylades would be the first I'd see. That, having, uh, that after having lost you for six months and more, you'd be restored to me at the court of Pyrrhus. So the rhyming has all gone, the lines run on, no plodding end stops, and the language now is modern and idiomatic in places, uh, more so later on. Also, uh, I wanted to say that since the language, the English language, abounds in imagery, that's one of the characteristics of English really, I think, compared to, certainly compared to both French and German, to deprive it of imagery, in other words, to sort of anglicise it and, and make it spare, uh, as is the case with Racine, would be to emasculate it, uh, in my view. But the length of the lines has remained the same at 12 syllables and 6 stresses. This retention was due at the time to my timidity in the face of Racine's renowned density. How could I lose two syllables and still convey his meaning? Reading Lytton Strachey is enough to put anyone off trying at all, and I quote, That Racine should have succeeded in fusing into his tiny, commonplace vocabulary arranged in rhyming couplets according to the strictest and most artificial rules, not only the beauty of modern, of true poetry, but the varied subtleties of character and passion is one of those miracles of art that defy analysis. And as the prolific theatre translator Robert David MacDonald of the Citizen Theatre Glasgow adds after quoting this, it, is also, it also defies translation, in his view. But to try we must. MacDonald in his Phaedra, his translation of Phaedra, goes for an Alexandrine, but in the Cheek by Jowl uh, production, the actors spoke of the uh, length, line length and how this created breathing problems for them, mm. used as they were to blank verse. I was reminded of Alexander Pope's rejection of the Alexandrine, which, quote, like a wounded snake drags its slow length along. So it was that I set about shortening the lines, and in the Oxford Theatre Guild production and in the volume, The Trials of Love, uh, this is what you now hear. Yes, finding such a true friend as you again convinces me my luck has finally turned. That fate has seen fit to reunite us here already shows how much my lot has improved. For who would have said that in a land I'd sworn to shun, Pylades would be the first I'd see? That having lost you for more than six months, I'd find you here again at the court of Pyrrhus. So, five stresses now, the more customary pentameter rhythm, and a tad leaner and more muscular, I think, uh, it feels. So that is to do with the changes made. I just wanted to finish by having a quick word about the subject of rhyme, because you, you saw that after that first rather awful attempt, the rhyme went out the window. Um, as I point out in uh, this thing, which is available uh, also, uh, translating the Alexandra, rhyme comes more easily in the French language, and in English tends to awaken expectations of humour. Uh, so it was that the, so it is that the vast majority of Molière translations, if not all of them, are, are in rhyming verse, whereas blank verse is preferred for classical tragedies. However, in both Andromache and the Cid, which is also in this volume, I have employed the occasional use of a rhyming couplet for a variety of reasons, and I think there has to be a reason for it e in each case. So the first one, summing up a situation. 
bringing an argument to a close. That's one of them. So we have Pylades or Pylades, uh, how do you pronounce them? We're saying Pylades, but you Pylades can say Pylades, 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 <laughs> explaining to Orestes how things stand with Pyrrhus and his supposed fiance Hermione. He could indeed, in this disordered state, torture her he loves, marry out of hate. So you see why it's used there? Then later, Orestes, as Greek envoy, he's setting out the case for the surrender of Astanax. The rhyme here, I think, helps to give the impression of a prepared speech. He's the envoy, he's prepared this. The threat most feared is that this lion's whelp will learn to relish Greek blood with your help. And then there are many other occasions, but there's just the last one here. There are times when a rhyme is used almost as if a proverb is being employed in the argument, as when Orestes is skeptical about Hermione's claim not to love Pyrrhus. Voice, silence, eyes, always give us away. Sparks stamped out once are forest fires today. So the use of rhyme for such and other appropriate reasons not only elevates the tone momentarily, but also provides a punch which, if used throughout, would become mechanical and lose its power, I think. So thanks to James, uh, the midwife to the adventure. <laughs> My firstborn is now reborn. <laughs> and although she's now 37 years old, she has lost rather than gained weight, having, gone, <laughs> having been taken to Slimming World and is leaner and meaner, and appears from reports uh, coming back from uh, the Trinity College Chapel to be packing a punch. So thank you to James and thank you to everyone involved. Thank you very much, David. Um, so we have some time, actually uh, 20 minutes we have uh, for questions and also for discussion uh, among the panellists. So while people in the room are thinking about what questions they might like to ask, um, I'm going to uh, ask our panellists maybe to, to speak to each other uh, a little bit. Uh, and if you have questions uh, for David in particular, and David, if you have questions for, for our uh, academic experts, uh, this would be a, a great time to, uh, to, to pose them. Um, I, I have a question about the, the rhyme, actually. D David and I... Uh, Sat, sat down together uh, for a, whole, a lot, very long but very enjoyable day uh, in, in my office. We should have recorded it. Which we should have recorded, <laughs> yes. And went through the, the entire script line by line, yep. uh, looking at uh, changes that I wanted to make and changes that David wanted to make to, to the working uh, version. And, and I was, if you remember, changes I was... Changes that I wanted to keep. And, and some changes that you wanted <laughs> to keep, yes. And some of my changes, I'm very proud to say, have made it into the published version, which I'm very pleased about. Um, uh, but one of the things that... that uh, that I'd tried to look at a bit more was actually some of the places where there are rhyming couplets, in particular where there are split couplets. Yeah. Often in, in the Racine you get the end of a speech, which, uh, the, the rhyme of which is then picked up by the, the next character speaking, yeah. the yeah. beginning of the next speech. Yeah. Um, there's a moment where uh, uh, Orestes is trying to put off the uh, thing that Hermione is wanting him to do and says, tonight you'll have your way. Yeah. Uh, and Hermione uh, uh, picks up on the next, uh, beginning of her next speech with, meanwhile, he weds Andromache today. And that's, that's, right. a, that's exactly a mirror of what happens yeah. in the French, where there's a, there's yeah. a split couplet yeah. in, the, in, in the French. Um, and I wonder about the effects to which we can use rhyme as well, just to remind an English-speaking audience occasionally that, that that's what the Racine is like, that, that, yeah. that the, the, the rhyme, that the, the 12 syllable rhyming couplet is such a, a central way uh, that his verse works to, to keep the rhythm of the speech going and also to hand over the baton sometimes from one character to, to another. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's something that you think is also a, a legitimate reason for keeping it in in English because we're trying to do something which is in fact Racinian where we're actually m most of the time, as you, as you said, and when, when it's been done in English, it, it, it's not terribly effective mm -hmm. poetically in English to do that. Yes, uh, especially if it's like my awful first version, <laughs> which is end stopped. It already comes. Mm. Oh dear! But you also, I mean, you're deprived of the chance to to use it for a specific purpose. Mm. Uh, uh, that's my my main argument here. So I ended that with that, um, and, and that would be a shame, I think. And, and again, I mean, rhyme, as I said at the beginning, you know, rhyme uh, is uh, for English ears is tends to have this expectation of humour. Mm. Um, 
But they're very intimate in resin. That, that sharing of the rhyme is almost like sharing breath, yeah. right? Or sharing the space of the Alexandrian, yeah. which is this yeah. other important yeah. resinian space. Yeah. So that, that, that uh, they tend to come about those, those shared rhymes between characters at moments of great menace or eroticism. And they might often come to be the same yeah. thing in resin, right? Mm, that, that, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's great to be able to puncture with them sometimes. We have a question from the online audience, which I'm going to direct to Fiona. Mm -hmm. I think it's mainly intended to you. Um, uh, someone was interested to hear you talking about the way that in the teaching of classics, the Euripides version of Andromache is often overlooked, certainly among the other, among the Euripides mm -hmm. canon and, and, and among the, the, the classical canon more generally. And, uh, the uh, uh, question was, do you also think that Andromache as a character is overlooked in favour of some of the, more, the, some of the better known female uh, characters in that canon? For example, Helen. So everyone knows who Helen is. But actually, maybe we don't know who Andromache is. When the, when the poster was first put up around Oxford, we were very concerned because of the way that it was uh, presented in blocks of text. Not this one that you're going to see now, but the, the, the one that we were using and that's also on our, on our programme. Because we split the line because it's difficult to get the word Andromache into a, an A4 portrait format. So we had Andromache in several different blocks of text. And we were worried that people wouldn't recognise the name, uh, which in fact was the case. Uh, so I wonder, we wonder, uh, I wonder about, about that. Is Andromache as a character also overlooked? And should she get more attention? I, that's an interesting question. And I would say definitely Euripides Andromache. And I don't mean the play. I mean the character is completely overlooked. Uh, even, I think, in, believe it or not, discussions of the Trojan women. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's important. But I think she's not so overlooked because people tend to know, perhaps through the iconography, that amazing scene in book six of the Iliad, the farewell scene um, between mm. Andromache and Hector, and, Hector. Mm. and um, with baby Astyanax, you know, kind of touching the helmet of his father. And um, I think, uh, I mean, there are some extraordinary beautiful uh, the figurings of, of that scene in, in contemporary poetry. And um, uh, Michael Longley, perhaps sort of best of all I can think of, uh, he actually uh, reproduces it in a rhyming couplet. Uh, absolutely wonderfully. And um, so I think people are very interested once they know that book of, of the Iliad. But I think it is very notable that if maybe we saw this play more, and I did do a quick um, search on the APGRD database, and I think in living memory for those, those of us who are older than most of you in the room, it may well be just um, John Barton's The Greeks that included at the RSC, um, around about 1980, I think, um, 1780, that time. included, mm. uh, no, 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 John Barton's. Okay. Do you remember he did a sort of great compilation that included um, the Andromache? And I, I, I mean, that is quite extraordinary. So um, mm. it's, you know, definitely time for a, a revival. So, yeah, I, yes, we know Helen, and because mm. people have taken risks with Helen, the Euripides play called Helen, and also been fascinated by her. She's been rewritten as um, Marilyn Monroe mm. and, and mm. many other contemporary figures, but no one has tried, I think, to find, um, except Michael Longley, I can think of, yeah. um, quite such a kind of powerful resonant uh, Andromache. It's a, I mean, you write about this in your in your program notes, I think, really beautifully. It's a play in part about being the, and what, it, what is it like to be the daughter of Helen, mm -hmm. right? That's a, that's a, a tough role. Qu'on parle de nous ainsi que de nos pères, <laughs> oh, or as yeah, right? To, uh, yeah, Herm if we could ever match up to these. Her yeah, Hermione. Hermione. Yeah, yes, no, 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 exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that, that also, um, in, in so many ways, um, Hermione, and Orestes here, yes. desperately trying to, to you know, yeah. having, you know, yeah. sort of overbearing su superhuman sort of yeah. father syndrome for yeah. Orestes. Yeah. And, um, and that's right, 
a, a mother who yeah. who can set the world alight yeah. literally yeah. and Hermione's frustrations that she is I, all yeah. too diminutive. Yes. I used to tell students that this is like Nicole Ritchie or something but that's now an outdated reference also so <laughs> it's, it, it's about somebody who's famous for being the child of somebody. I, uh, yeah no no I know and famous. we see that all the time Brother don't we? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Shadow people who have a kind of social media career that's what yeah. I felt today but, with but that it, Hermione. Um, one of the because their parents Oh, One of well the known. oddities of teaching this play in particular um, is that students often, my students don't know Racine, but they have little fragments of a classical tradition from somewhere, um, often quite so sort of loosely derived and one of the things they know sometimes is that Orestes kills his mother mm -hmm. and they're always confused that that's not going on here, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Uh, so that, that sort of fragmented relation to character, I think, is, um, is really striking in, in, in reading of this today, mm. that you, you bring a kind of mosaic um, to they these They would have known figures. that at the end, though, wouldn't they? When the furies, when the the furies come. Appear, yes. Yes. It's yeah. not just... Yes. No, <laughs> no, no, no there's a whole load of history <laughs> going on there. Yeah. Right, him. right, yeah. <laughs> For that reason. And, and I think in, in Euripides, we're, which is really a play about kind of marital crises in multiple ways, um, we are always reminded of those failed marriages behind, you know, Agamemnon's and Clytemnestra's. And um, uh, it, you, it, it and, and the framing for those of you who, who are interested in knowing more about the Euripides is one marriage that works, and that is Thetis's marriage to Peleus, mm. and uh, which gets sort of celebrated at the end as Peleus is made immortal. So, which is a rather beautiful ending. So, you know, once when a Deus ex machina appears, you know, Thetis, um, and then literally lifts her husband up to join her mm. um, via via a cave but anyway the ultimate um, goal is mm. one marriage that works mm. there's another translation i we were talking about this just before but maybe we could all pile into it yeah. together um i forgot to say this when i was talking about the place of the of trinity chapel i found it really extraordinary at the end uh, Restes, uh railing against god in your translation which is les dieux uh, au pluriel in the plural mm. in the French, and that, that you hold yes. it in the plural yes. and then and then turn it to capital G God, yes. um, and that that's all the more compelling in this particular. There's a kind of Nietzschean performance of yeah. Orestes here. Um, that we, we, James and I talked about that in our, in our that mm. in our day yeah. that we had, and it was hard because we do talk about the gods, don't we? Yes. Uh, um, sometimes, I uh, uh, don't know why we do, <laughs> it's sort of just part of the language. A neat formula, mm. um, yeah. But at that particular moment, I think we felt it should be God. Yeah. Mm. Uh, packs a better punch than just the gods. Yes, you know, oh, it certainly gods packs a punch in the chapel. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. it's on the steps something. of the, delivered from the steps of the altar. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, I mean, we did think about that very consciously in terms yeah. of thinking yeah. about the staging. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and when we worked on, on the version that we're using for this production, we, we knew what the staging was going to be, so that yeah. was certainly very much in, mm. in, in my mind. But I think it does also make sense more, more generally. Elsewhere in the in, in the text, we do have gods in the plural, in the same way as you would in English talk about in the lap of the gods, or yeah, you know, that's that, right. that, that, that in that kind of idiomatic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 informal kind of usage. But yes, the idea that it's God who's kind and God who's yeah. You know, and God also kind of stands in, I guess, for, for us, for, for a bunch of other things, you know, for, for, for fate and for fortune. And yeah. for, <laughs> yes, exactly. For, you know, the, and, 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 and for, for us, the things that are driving rest is obviously, so the furies at the end are, you know, the, the outpouring of his, his, his mental illness, basically, as a, as a damaged veteran of a recent war. And also someone who has this this enormous emotional need to to find validation in this woman who's just rejected him. So there is a very very modern contemporary way of reading that I think that also makes sense of what the Greeks were on about with the Furies. You know, so we don't need to worry about whether or not we know that he's killed Clytemnestra already. Kind of doesn't matter. I think for our audience, although it certainly adds a, a depth to it. If you yeah, if you if you've got those kind of fragmentary bits of of classical uh, background. I was really, head. really struck by your, your wartime staging or right, the, the kind of veteran element mm. of this. Um, it's one, some recent readings, Timothy Hampton's reading of, of uh, fictions of diplomacy, he calls it in the early modern period, focuses on this as a play about a failed embassy, yes. right? Um, yeah. and, uh, and he talks about it as a sort of, that Orestes is, uh, 
The previous generation are all martial heroes and he's an administrative ambassador who totally screws up by doing a thing which I won't tell you about, <laughs> um, but not something that an ambassador is meant to do. Whereas you kind of squish the, the things together, yeah. those, those roles. Um, and I found that really powerful, actually, as a sort of, let's say, a character explanation for, for the melancholy, rage, yeah. fureur mm. um, that comes here. I'm not seeing any hands in the room, but if anybody does have questions, please do ask them. How do people find Orestes? Because uh, reading the play again, um, I, I kind of swing along with it, but except when I come to the part of Orestes. Oh. Mm. <laughs> I, I always feel Orestes is a bit of a drip. Oh, well, <laughs> that's why he's so interesting on the page, but mm. this Orestes is quite undrippy. Oh, right. Right. It, this okay. is an angry I'm Orestes. Glad to hear that. Orestes, how did you feel because about Because I so Orestes? sympathize with Hermione when she, you know, says, oh, God, you know, shut up. <laughs> I know that Worthy Hermione is, is the, the most horrific and terrifying character in all of French literature for me. <laughs> um, and she's impeccably that in this mm. production. But, but uh, I mean, how did you Without play Orestes? Without putting on the, on the yeah. spot. Uh, well, I was just gonna, I, you can sometimes fall into that trap, of, you, know, oh, you know, oh God, you said about this or whatever. But for me, reading the script, what I, what I try to put into him is, is maybe like, a, a strong desire to be happy and to enjoy life, but sort of he has all these awful things chasing him and pulling him back and dragging him back to like sorrow and fear and hurt. And that's kind of how I made myself enjoy him a little bit and that he's not just like, you know, mopey all the time, but mm. maybe there is a version of Orestes with some different luck that is happy. <laughs> yeah, so for the benefit of the online audience, I'm just going to relay in, in brief what, since we have uh, uh, Sid Cowley, who's our Orestes in the, in the audience, uh, there's something about Orestes who's const constantly kind of desiring a, another possible future. Right? In fact, he says at one point to Hermione, um, preparing to leave, mm. uh, I thought I'd come to ask if I might hope for a future, but I think I've already heard your answer to that. It must be hard for you to disguise your hatred. And, um, and he's kind of, yeah, so he's, he's a character who's driven by this, this, this other possible futurity, which might be an escape from, from, his, from his doom, right, that he's constantly trying to find, and, uh, and that, that fate, or rather the other characters around him, are constantly foreclosing for him. Um, and yeah, so that I think there's a lot of potentiality in that, in that character with potentials that are, that are foreclosed, as in fact there are for all of them, because of course it's a tragedy and we know it's all going to end badly. <laughs> but the characters don't know that. They don't know until the last act what their decisions are going to be and where their decisions will lead them. We know that it's all going to end terribly because we know we're sitting watching a tragedy, but the characters never really know what their, what their fate's going to be until it's too late. And has, uh, sorry, I, I just suggest, hasn't Orestes' life just always been... <laughs> about being tasked with the impossible mm -hmm. and uh, um, he, and and also as he's tasked with the impossible he can't make decisions on his own because for the good reasons <laughs> but he needs Pylades to make him remind him that Apollo is driving him and and here being again tasked with the impossible because it runs counter to his instincts um, so he, like you yes he, <laughs> I have some sympathy for this young man, partly again, like your undergraduates, because you know I'm bringing other versions of uh, the character to bear even on on the Racine, and I think I I always sort of intuit with Racine because he's such a good classicist that he he's also um, expecting his audiences to kind of understand that on on mm. one kind of level. With Hermione, I completely agree with you, Catherine. She's monstrous. <laughs> completely monstrous, yeah. But again, she's monstrous because of what her parentage has made her, right? I mean, at least for us, her, she's monstrous because she's this dreadfully emotionally neglected child whose mother has been absent her entire life and in whose shadow she's had to grow up and she's desperate not to be sent home to this monstrous, awful family, <laughs> desperate to get her own independent status, which she yeah. intends to get by her marriage to Pyrrhus, which, she, which, yeah. is con which is denied to her. But the sort of tyranny of petulance yeah. comes across really fantastically in this mm. performance, I think. It's, um, you, you remind yeah. me of what you said on our day, which is uh, at the end, you know, because you could say Orestes is suffering from unrequited love, mm. as is Pyrrhus. Yes. Um, but 
uh, you said it's nothing to do with love. Mm. It's all to do with status. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to elaborate yes, on that? Yes, which I do think. I mean, I think, I think what, what's interesting about this play, again, from a contemporary perspective, is that when our characters talk about love, it's really not about romance at all. It's certainly not about what we would understand a kind of 19th century romantic love or, or, or literary romantic love at all. It's about the various things that you can mean when you say love to people, which can mean obsession, possession, uh, validation, uh, subordination, submission, domination, uh, and, and, and all of those things are in play for all these people. Hermione loves Pyrrhus, or thinks she loves Pyrrhus. To me, I think what she loves is the idea of a status which she can get as an independent woman out of the shadow of her mother, finally, by marriage to this great war hero, by whose deed she is, in fact, absolutely horrified. Yes, exactly. yeah. And at the end, when she turns on Pyrrhus and says, yeah. you know, you, you, and, and, and rebukes him for all his, his deeds yeah. at Troy, which he's previously talked about as these great heroic exploits, when she throws them back in, her, in his face as a, as a litany of war crimes, mm. yeah. what really comes out is a very... Uh, vulnerable child who's terrified by all these powerful warlike men about her and who and, and all these powerful warlike men including her father of course Menelaus who's who, who at whose mercy she is and, and her attempt to get some kind of agency which she can also only exercise through other men tragically through Orestes is, is her own special you know tragedy in which she's, she's caught so I think that, that thing about trying to get status through other people and through mm. the validation that other people can give you mm. and, and similarly for Pyrrhus Pyrrhus doesn't love Andromache he wants Andromache to but submit to him like the like, because she's the last bit of Troy that he hasn't managed to conquer and yeah. it's her resistance that drives the whole the whole dynamic and, and so, so, so to me that when, when they talk about love they're talking about a lot of things but they're never talking about affection a caring yeah. or well, caring well, it, it, it's except with, with except for Andromache who, who, whose love is a protective maternal yeah. drive to preserve the life of her son and even that is pathological also, because it's not really her son that she loves it's peculiar. Hector in yes. her son yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, in yeah. French, il m'aurait tenu lieu d'un père et d'un époux. He would have yes. held the place of my uh, father and, 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 and my, my spouse. House, yeah. And that, I mean, it's both an emotional thing and, and I think a kind of legal question. Like, this is the man of the household, yeah. uh, tenir lieu. Yes. But, well, yes, so, yes, and, and, in the space, en, and in yeah. the end, of course, she, and she also, and, and we also do this symbolically, I think, in the production, that in the, in the end, Andromache ends up upholding the patriarchy mm. right, yeah. by passing on the power to mm. Astyanax, yeah. who she's, who she, whose life she has Spoiler managed to, to preserve. But yes, yeah. too many spoilers. Yeah. We are, I think, just about out of time. Um, so thank you all very, very much. Uh, we, we will continue our discussion, I'm sure, um, after the show later. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining Thanks, us. Active. Thank you all at home for joining us, too. Uh, and uh, we can just uh, very quickly thank all our panellists. Thank you very much. <laughs>